it's Revelation chapter 10. My name is Brian Reed. I have the privilege of sharing our scripture reading with you all today. Revelation chapter 10. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillar of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded, and when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to, take, to give me the scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Thank you, Brian. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, once again, we count it a privilege to be gathered together as your people. We count it a privilege that we can come before you through Jesus Christ. We count it a privilege that we have your word. Father, help us to be good stewards with all of that this morning. We ask for your blessing on the ministry of your word. Father, give us humble hearts. Give us excited hearts to receive the truth that you have for us this morning. Have your way with us. Have your way for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brian, for reading, and have a, a few things. Just want to, again, for our children, glad that you are in here with us, and hopefully you're able to grab one of these green papers, and uh, had a good response a couple weeks ago about, uh, you know, we provided something, not just to color, but I want you to be able to draw and write down what it is that we're seeing, all right, here in Revelation chapter 5. So really your task, uh, and if you are, if you're 45 years old and you want to take one and draw and do it, that's fine. But I want you to draw what's happening in Revelation chapter 10. We're going to work through it, and you can kind of put it down as a picture. And there are five boxes on the sheets, and uh, we're going to be talking about the plan of God this morning. And here are five different key words when it comes to the plan of God. All right? So that's your task. And um, show me when you're done. I'd love to see what it is that you write down and how you picture it, how to kind of pictures in your mind. I'd love to be able to see that. For all of us, though, this morning, uh, I bring greetings from uh, uh, Camden Baptist Church, our brothers and sisters there. Uh, they appreciate your willingness to allow them to have me come and speak. Uh, the pastors there, Larry uh, Nacella, Bill Copas, every year like to bring in one or two of the pastors in our fellowshipping group of churches, and uh, this year they asked me to come, so they send their appreciation, they send their greetings, yeah, uh, they are uh, they are a beautiful group of people, uh, very loving, very serving and kind. If there is a need in our community, uh, they will be one of those churches to step into that need, and uh, so it was a joy to be with them. And God has blessed us as a church with uh, two very capable men who can stand up here in the pulpit and take seriously the Word of God and have a super tender heart for you. And uh, I appreciate Ryan's. Uh, time in Revelation chapter 9 and his preaching and filling last week. Appreciate Dre and his leadership and uh, you'll get to hear more of them here in a couple months as we keep working through this. Uh, but God has been good to our church. It's really too bad though for us. Um, chapters 8, 9, and 10 um, to have to have a week in between the messages. You know, we get to jump in, we get to read, we get to study it, we get to feel it, we get to, to see what it is that God's doing, and then we get to take a week to kind of like decompress. And we come back to it, jump in again, feel a little bit overwhelmed, 
see the grace of God and feel some hope and some, some motivation. And then we get to take another week to decompress. And then here we are in chapter 10. We're going to jump in again. John didn't have that luxury. John is experiencing this, and it is like a railroad a, a train on the tracks going at full speed. And he doesn't get the kind of breaks that we get as we're, kind of, as we're studying through this. And it's really, I mean, John, as he's experiencing this, there he is in the throne room, sees the trumpets beginning to blow, each angel one after another. He sees his first angel blow the trumpet, and he sees what's happening here on the earth, hail and fire coming down mixed with blood, destroying all the green grass. Then he sees this thing that looks like this burning, fiery mountain gets thrown into the ocean, he sees a third of the ocean turn into blood, a third of the creatures in the ocean dying. He sees a, a third of the ships being destroyed. Then he sees this, what looks like, a, again, a fiery star that gets thrown down to the freshwater supply, and a third of the freshwater gets bitter. Many people are dying from it. Then he sees a fourth trumpet being blown, and a third of the sun and the moon and the stars, the light goes out. And then, just without a delay, we had a, a week delay. Without delay, he hears this angel saying that there's three more woes coming. You think that's bad? It's going to get worse. And then the, the, the fifth angel blows his trumpet, and this angel comes down, and he opens up that abyss, and out come these scorpion-like demonic creatures running all over the earth torturing people for five months. Men, they're like longing just for it to be over, some to die, and they can't. They just have to deal with it. And then the sixth trumpet blows. And those four demonic leaders, those angels, are released, and they, they gather up their armies behind them, 200 million, 200 million strong, and they just go out, and they have authority to kill a third of all mankind. And this is just happening over and over and over. We had weeks in between to kind of, okay, decompress, to kind of come back to it. Let's talk about it. John is just hit, it's just hitting him over and over and over. And on top of all of that, he looks down and he sees mankind and their reaction. People aren't looking at what's happening and experiencing it saying, oh, I've got to quit. I've just got, no, they just continue to be unrepentant. They continue to reject God. Not turning from their wicked ways. Not turning from their idolatry. Just saying, we don't care what God is doing to us. We're just going for it even more. Imagine how John was just feeling overwhelmed by what was happening and probably just sickened and discouraged by seeing the response of the people on the earth. And as I was reflecting over that as we get into chapter 10, a couple of thoughts were just kind of driving my thinking a little bit and I posted a picture this week just the blue sky and sun in the corner and I just kind of wrote underneath it you know what the world's not as bad as it could be and I was thinking about that was one of those thoughts that was just kind of rolling around in my mind as I was preparing for chapter 10 reviewing chapters 8 and 9 and what what's going to be happening on the earth and thinking, you know what? I'm glad I don't live then. <laughs> and as, as bad as this world can seem to me and as, you know, we continue to we move further and further away from what God has called us to be and what nations are need to be, we keep moving away from His truth and, and as bad as the world feels, it's not as bad as it could be. It's just not. God's common goodness and grace continues. Continues to be good to people. He continues to provide for them. Continues to care for them. You see it in your lives. I've heard some of your testimonies in sharing just how God has been good. Well, the common goodness and the common grace of God continues in our world. It, it, it's not. You read something like Roman, or Revelations chapters 8 and 9 and you have to realize, you know what? It's not as bad as it could be. And that's an encouragement to us. Continue on. 
And I found myself thinking and remembering, you know, John, there in that throne room before the uh, those seal judgments and into the trumpet judgments, and that little parenthesis, that first parenthesis, and, you know, who is it that can stand? And John is told, you know what, those, those 144,000 that God has sealed, they're going to stand. And then he sees just this innumerable multitude of people that he is told had come out of the tribulation because of their faith in Jesus Christ. They were saved during the tribulation. And were they going through all of this? I mean, if, if they were seeing all of this happen in their world, what was it that these believers who were living in, it can't get any better or any worse than this? What is it that they would hold on to? What is it that they were just kind of having a grip on just to have any kind of hope? What were they clinging to? Because if, if they had something to cling to, in my it's not as bad as it could be world, that should be enough for me too. What is it? Well, we see it here in chapter 10. And it's this in a general sense, that the plan of God presses on. And for our kids here, as you, right on the bottom you have some fill-in-the-blanks. But not just for our kids, for all of us, just to be reminded that my life is in God's plan. My life is in God's plan. And if there's nothing else that we walk away with this morning, let it be that. That our lives, whether we're seven years old or 97 years old, the entirety of our lives, everything about our lives fits perfectly in God's plan. There's nothing happening right now that is outside of his plan. There's nothing happening that's disconnected to his plan. We've been called to, to step into that and to engage in God's plan. And I want us to notice as we work through what John is experiencing, five different dynamics or elements, five things that are highlighted, five highlights of God's plan here in Romans, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 10. Well, John, as he's seeing just the rebelliousness of people on this earth and their refusal to repent, his attention is drawn to this mighty angel. He's told that this mighty angel comes down from heaven, and he's described in a bunch of... He's, there's a lot of descriptors for this mighty angel. First of all, he is. He's coming down from heaven. We first saw a mighty angel in chapter 5 when John was there before the throne and this mighty angel cried out, who's worthy to open up the scroll? And of course there was silence. And then Jesus is presented. He's the one who's worthy to open the scroll. Well, this is another mighty angel. There's something about this angel that is just impressive and overwhelming in size and strength and just his presence, his commanding presence. Well, this mighty angel is coming down from heaven and he's wrapped in a cloud. Kind of like, you know, Jesus ascended into heaven in a cloud. Well, this mighty angel is, is clothed or he's wrapped with this cloud. There's just clouds around him. And he's coming down from heaven. And all of these descriptors kind of have as their root as is a common theme with the throne room of heaven. Not only is there clouds, there's a rainbow over his head. If you remember there in the throne room, around the throne was a single green colored rainbow. Well, this mighty angel has this rainbow over his head. He has a face like the sun. His feet were like pillars of fire. And in his hand is a little scroll that is opened. And all of these things are consistent and really kind of find their pattern in chapters 5 and 6. So it's almost like this mighty angel that is coming down from heaven is bringing heaven, all of what that is representing with him. He's a representative of heaven. 
And this little scroll, probably, I think it's, it's different than the scroll that Jesus had with the seven seals. This is specifically called a little one. But I think it represents the same thing. It's similar. You know, the scroll that Jesus had that he took and had the seven seals that was written on the inside and on the outside of it represented the plan of God in its entirety. Well, this little scroll represents the same thing, the plan of God, just that this little scroll is opened. In other words, it's unfolding. Everything on the scroll and in the scroll is happening. So this mighty angel coming down, sent from heaven, with heaven's authority, heaven's representative, that throne room, has in his hand the open scroll, the plan of God, and it's almost as if there's a statement that the plan of God is happening here on this earth. And I want us to notice the first thing about the plan of God that's being highlighted here is that it is divine. I know that's kind of the obvious point where we're talking about God's plan, but let's not forget that God's plan is divine. This angel represents the throne room. All of those descriptors of the throne room are also describing this angel, this mighty angel. And the plan of God is divine. What do we mean by that? Well, what's true about God is what's true about this plan. Just think of some of the, the qualities and the characteristics of our God. He's holy. Well, his plan is holy. Our God is true. Well, this unfolding plan is true. Our God is gracious and merciful. Well, his plan is gracious and merciful. Our God is just. His plan is just. He's right. Well, his plan is right. Our God is good. His plan is good. The plan of God reflects God himself. Not only is, the plan, not only is God's plan divine, John begins to see this angel. It's coming down from heaven. And he puts his feet on the earth. He takes his right foot and he puts it on the sea, takes his left foot and he puts it on the land. And what John is seeing, he's not seeing like what you and I would do if we were to go to the East Coast, where we would take a left foot maybe and put it on the sand and a right foot put it in the water. No, John is seeing this mighty angel stepping on the earth itself. Such a, this massive, intimidating, commanding figure standing on top of the earth. It's right foot in the sea and it's, land, and it's left foot on the land. Making the earth seem small. Is that not our God? If the representative from God is bigger than the earth... I guarantee you our God is bigger than the earth. He's bigger than all that's happening. He makes it look small. And it, it, it portrays for us that this little scroll that is un unfolding, the plan of God is unfolding onto the earth, that it is global. The plan of God is also global. It's all-encompassing. The smallest, most minute detail of what's happening on the earth is in the plan of God. There's not a corner of the earth that isn't included in the plan of God. Not one of us here in this room are living a life off in the corner, in the shade, in the darkness, outside of God's plan. Everything is included. Whether it's the tree in the forest that falls that we wonder, did it make a sound? It's in the plan of God. The birds that are gathering their food and, and, and uh, pieces of wood and sticks and leaves for their nest, part of the plan of God. The flowers that we see springing to life, every single one of them on every part of the face of this earth is a part of the plan of God. The weather swings that we are experiencing every year, but now in, in Cleveland, 
as March has seemed to be coming in like a lion or like a lamb, we know how it's going to come out, is a part of the plan of God. The greatest human accomplishment of history, a part of the plan of God. The most horrific moment in human history, a part of the plan of God. The amount of homework that you've gotten this week, a part of the plan of God. The relationship struggles and excitements that you've had this week, a part of the plan of God. There is nothing in your life that is outside the plan of God. And that is being visualized for John as he sees this mighty angel with the appearance of heaven overshadowing the earth, stepping on the earth. And then as John is watching this, there seems to happen this mysterious conversation. This massive mighty angel cries out and he sounds like a roaring lion. So he's not this little person with a soft voice. There's just this commanding sound of a voice coming out of that mighty angel. And then John, after he hears this mighty angel cry out with a loud voice, hears seven thunders kind of respond, and each of those seven thunders speak their sound. And John, as a good prophet, as he has been doing already up until this point, is hearing this, and he starts to write it down. He's going to record what was said. And then John, as he starts to write down, hears a voice from heaven saying, Stop. What you are hearing said, seal up and don't write it down. Wait a minute. John's here. If, if, when, when I get up into heaven, this is gonna, I'm going to look up John and be like, Hey, John, what were those thunders saying? Because we see God here saying, No, listen, don't write this down. Everything else that we have in Revelation, John's writing down and recording and sharing it with the seven churches and us, except for this. Is God withholding information from us? Yes. There's a part of this scene that is inaccessible to us. And what we are seeing in this moment about the plan of God is yes, it is knowable. Because we have revelation. We have the entirety of Scripture. The plan of God is knowable. We can know it. We can know it sufficiently. But we don't know it entirely. You know, we, we feel a sense of security and safety and hope when we can know something. When we've looked at every angle and anything that can be known, I know it, and now I'll move forward. And we're seeing a glimpse here that as God's people, we don't know everything. There is still a part of God's plan that is yet inaccessible and unknown to us. We know it's there because John has heard it, but it's not for us to know. And it's really not a foreign idea in Scripture. Two times as Daniel is receiving his visions and his revelation from God, he is told to to write it and to seal it up and to shut it up because it's for later, not for now. Paul, in his ministry, knew of a man, whether it was himself or another person, who, through the Holy Spirit, was taken up to a third heaven, 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 12, and he heard things but he couldn't tell people what they were. And then listen to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. It says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the works of this law. You see, the Old Testament saints didn't have everything, but they had enough for their faithfulness. The New Testament, we as saints, as God's people, we don't have everything, but we have enough for his faithfulness. I I am a firm believer that God has revealed the finished and complete work of God. This is everything that he needs us to know. But it's not entirely 
what there is to know about God. There is still some that is inaccessible to us. But we have enough and we can know sufficiently in order to fill our role faithfully. And it's okay. There is still a mystery of what God is going to do. And after John is told to just seal it, don't write it down, it's in his head, he knows what was being said. This angel, this mighty angel, begins to, he raises his right hand to the heavens. Verse 5, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to the heaven and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created uh, uh, heaven and what's in it and earth and what's in it and created the sea and what's in it, that there would be no more delay, but in the days of the trumpet call uh, that's to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God will be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. This mighty angel, like a person in a courtroom, raises their right hand and swears an oath that this is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And this angel raises his hand to heaven, and, almost, and by swearing, he's not saying a bad word, he's by the person who is in heaven, who lives forever and ever, by the creator, he created heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them, it's by this person their truth, their reliability, so will be mine, what I am about to say. And the two things that he says, that there will be no more delay, but the mystery of God is going to be completed, finished, when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, and everything that God had told the prophets, his servants before, will be finished, completed. And this tells us that the plan of God is unfailing. It's unfailing. We're going to see this completion as we continue to move through Revelation. But one of the things that I want you to notice is that what this angel is speaking and what John is hearing, do you notice that he said, God is going to complete what he has proclaimed to his servants, the prophets, one of whom is, is, is John. Others, Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Joel. You see, this angel is making this proclamation that what is happening in Revelation is a furtherance and a continuation of what he has told the prophets thousands of years ago. It's the same plan. It's the same story, and it's unfailing. You see, God is not writing a hundred different stories in here. He's writing one story. He has one plan, and you're in it. When you wake up this morning, it's not your story. It's God's story. And you're in it. And it's unfailing. It will be completed. And this scene ends with an interesting, awkward meal. After hearing this mighty angel raise his hand to the heavens make that proclamation, that truth about what's going to be completed. That voice from heaven again speaks to John. The one who told him to stop writing now tells him to go to the angel and tell the angel to give you the scroll. So just now, put yourself in John's sandals. He's in this experience and he sees this mighty angel standing on the earth. When you, when you think about the size of the earth, I think each of us begins to feel very small. And if you're small on the earth, how small do you think you'll feel next to this massive angel? You probably could squirm your way between his skin cells. But here's John, I'm sure feeling a little intimidated. 
This voice from heaven says, go up to the angel. Ask for the scroll. So John does it. Walks up to that angel. Asks for the scroll. And that angel, remember his face is like a sun, his voice sounds like a roaring lion. Like that, that mighty angel's attention is all of a sudden all directed to this tiny little John. Imagine just, maybe he's shaking his knees or going a little bit. Angel gives him the scroll, but then the angel starts to talk to him and says, take it. You know, the voice from heaven just said, ask, ask him to give you the scroll. And now the angel tells him to take it, but also to do what with it? Eat it. Take the scroll, eat it. And he says, when you eat it, it'll make your stomach bitter. But before it'll make your stomach bitter, it's going to taste sweet in your mouth. So John obeys, takes the scroll, and eats it. I not recommend you taking a book and eating it for lunch. But remember, this is this, this apocalyptic vision, this experience that's happening to John. He takes the scroll, he eats it, and sure enough, he puts it in his mouth and he starts chewing and eating it, and it tastes sweet, like honey. He swallows it, and his stomach begins to churn, get all knotted up, starts to feel real sick. And you see, this is not the first time in Scripture that something like this happened. The prophet Ezekiel, thousands of years earlier, Ezekiel was a prophet for the nation of Israel, for Jerusalem specifically. He lived at the same time probably as Daniel and also Jeremiah. Jeremiah was in Jerusalem as a prophet during this time when Nebuchadnezzar came in, destroyed the city, and took people captive. Jeremiah stayed in Jerusalem. Ezekiel was with all of those exiled Jewish people, Israelites, in Babylon. And Ezekiel had the task from God as a prophet to speak to those Jewish people, those Israelites, God's chosen people. And in, in chapters 2 and 3 of Ezekiel, you'll see Ezekiel being told the same thing, to take a scroll, which represented God's plan, specifically for his people in Jerusalem. And he says, when you eat it, it's going to be sweet, but when you swallow it, it's going to make your stomach bitter. What was God telling Ezekiel? Listen, you receiving the word of God is a sweet thing. I mean, this is a precious treasure. The psalmist is right when he says that it is sweeter to us than the sweetest honey from any honeycomb. And it is more valuable to God's people than any gold or silver. That is the word of God to us. And when we can open it and study it and receive it, it is a sweet thing. But as God's people, and specifically a prophet like Ezekiel and John, we're not told as God's people to take the word of God and just kind of keep it to ourselves. Ezekiel had a responsibility. You need to take this, all this truth and you need to give it to your people. But he says, Ezekiel, you're going to be giving it to people who have hard hearts and want nothing to do with it. And they will reject it. And they will reject you. Hence it is bitter. And what it meant and what that symbolizes for Ezekiel, it also parallels what this was for John. John, as you are receiving this, it is sweet. And for God's people, you and I, as we are receiving it, it is sweet to us. But John had the responsibility and the task as, as this chapter ends with continuing. You must continue to prophesy. You have to speak this to my people, the seven churches, to the world. And the world, as we saw at the end of chapter 9, will reject it. And your ministry as a prophet will become bitter because of that. And the plan of God is very much a bittersweet thing for us as God's people. It is sweet to have God's word. To have the revelation of God given to us. To understand his heart. To understand his expectations. 
to have the word of God make sense of our lives, give direction and purpose. He's given us the gospel. He's given us life and a future. But he's also tasked the church to carry that into the, into the world, an unbelieving world. A world that is not quite the end of chapter 9, but a world that is moving there. And what it will be for God's people as they take the gospel and the truth into the world, we will be rejected and opposed. And as sweet as it is for us, it is just as, as bitter for us to carry it into the world and to feel the opposition and to experience it. But nonetheless, as John is told, listen, even though it is this bittersweet for you, you must carry it out. And I think about these seven churches, reading about John's experience and what it meant for them and what it means for us. Revelation in general is, is, is a wake-up call for these churches. Wake up from your lovelessness for Jesus. Wake up out of your lukewarmness. Wake up out of gravitating toward false doctrines. Wake up out of your sin. And press on in faithfulness. Reaffirm your allegiance to Jesus Christ. Step into the world and go into the world and make disciples. Wake up to that. Hold firm to the truth. Advocate for the truth. Because you are a part of the plan of God. You know, for these Christians living during this incredibly horrible time, the hope that they would cling to is that they were a part of the divine, global, noble, unfailing, bittersweet plan of God. They could drop the anchor of their lives right there and press on. That's what they could cling to. It's the plan of God. And for us this morning, in light of this divine, global, noble, unfailing, bittersweet plan of God, a plan that is characterized by who God is, it's all-encompassing, it's sufficiently knowable for me, although I can't know it entirely. It is sufficient for my own faithfulness today. The plan of God that is unhindered by the events in the world, it continues to be moved forward by those events. It's sweet in our reception, but bitter in our presentation and our championing in this world, and the response that we get for it. In light of this plan of God in which we can drop the anchor of our lives and hook it securely into this plan of God, what, was, what must we do? Suggest for us, first of all, that we need to place ourselves in the plan of God. And what I, I don't mean that we need to, I need to put myself into it. I need to recognize my place in it. This is my context every single day. Whether I'm standing up here in front of a wonderful group of people, or I'm alone in my office, or with my family at home, or on the road, whatever I am doing and wherever you find yourself, you are in the plan of God. See your place in it. There is, there is one plan in this world that is going and moving forward and it is God's plan. And your life is situated in that plan. You don't have a story that you can write. God has written your story. He's placed you in His plan. See, every single moment in relation to what God is accomplishing, what his purpose is, where he's moving things, see your life in that context. Second of all, rest in God's plan. There is so much in our world and our world is not as bad as it could be. And if it was true in a world that is, bad, is as bad as it could be, where they could find rest in the plan of God, surely I can find rest in the plan of God. There is much in our world that just wants to rattle us and unrest us. But we can have rest. You know, God has given us physical rest and we all know how it feels after a great night of rest, 
a good night's sleep. You wake in the morning, you feel like you haven't slept at all. But your energy is there, and you're ready to roll. You feel great. You have energy, you have strength, you have vigor, you have motivation. That's what rest does for the believer. God is like, listen, I'm going to give you physical rest so that you can wrap your mind around what it means to rest in me. And you can wake up every single morning knowing that I have hope for today and there's joy in today. I can have peace in today because my life is anchored to this plan of God. Rest in it. And I want to encourage us to draw near to the planner. I mean, if you, if you want to be where things are going, get close to the one who designed it. Get to know the heart of the, the one who planned it. And you'll see more clearly how you fit and what's expected. It's one of those reasons why in our, in our podcast we kind of hit the spiritual disciplines first. Because it's, it's in, in our time in the Word. It's in our time of prayer and worship and, and silence and solitude and in our times of, of serving and meditating on the Word of God and memorizing. It is in those moments that we draw near to the planner. And all of a sudden we get closer to the planner, we begin to see the plan and to see our place in the plan and to engage in the plan and have our lives anchored to the plan. You see, the, the closer you are to the one who plans, the less lost you'll be. Our Heavenly Father, this morning, thank you for the truth. I thank you that you are a God who plans. Father, we take tremendous hope and rest and joy knowing that this moment right now and the moments as we walk away from here, our moments this week all fall within your plan, the unfailing, divine, all-encompassing plan of God. Father, fill our hearts with joy because of it. Fill our hearts with rest because of your plan. But Father, motivate us and drive us to play our role faithfully in that plan. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.